attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and thank you for joining the RLS Foundation's webinar titled Depression in RLS. My name is Carla Dzienkowski and I'm the Executive Director of the RLS Foundation. Before we begin, please be aware that all attendees will remain on mute during this hour. We thank you for the questions submitted with your registration. Dr. Winkleman will answer as many questions as time allows after his presentation. After the webinar, you will receive an email with a link to the member uh, webinar recording. The webinar recording will also be made available in the members only section of our website. If you are not a foundation member and would like to review this and other re recorded webinars, we invite you to, to become a member today by going to rls.org. As always, individuals suspecting they may have RLS should consult a qualified health care provider. Information offered in this webinar is for informational purposes purposes and should not be considered a substitute for the advice of a health care provider. Our speaker today is Dr. John Winkleman. Dr. Winkleman is Chief of Sleep Disorders Clinical Research Program, Department of Psychiatry at MassGen in Boston, Massachusetts. He received his PhD from Harvard University in Psychobiology and his MD from Harvard Medical School. He finished a residency in Psychiatry and Fellowship in Neurology Sleep Disorders Medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. Winkleman has served as chair of several national organizations, the Nosology Committee and Movement Disorder Section of the American Academy of Sleep and the American Academy of Neurology Guide Committee for the Treatment of RLS. Since 2000, Dr. Winkleman has served on the RLS Foundation's Medical Advisory Board, which is now known as the Scientific and Medical Advisory Board. Dr. Winkleman's research interests include sleep-related movement disorders, insomnia, and parasomnias. Dr. Winkleman is a leading expert in the field of RLS and has published several textbooks and authored over 100 articles in the field of sleep medicine. Dr. Winkleman, we thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us today. I now invite Dr. Winkleman to begin his presentation. Thank you very much, Carla. I hope everybody out there in RLS land can hear me. Um, please message someone if you can't, but I, I should uh, be audible for everybody. I'm going to talk for roughly 25 minutes or so, and then uh, I know Carla's received many questions, and I'll try to answer them as well as uh, I can. So I start off today with a uh, description of a patient that I saw a few years ago to give everybody a sense of um, a kind of a common presentation that I'll see in my sleep clinic. This was a 42-year-old man who described a three-year history of leg restlessness in the evening associated with pulling feelings. That's how he described it, deep in his lower leg. Those were relieved by movement. They originally produced substantial difficulties with sleep onset and occasional awakenings from sleep. He was prescribed clonazepam for nightly use, which initially was beneficial for both the restlessness and the sleep disturbance. After a year, however, he needed to increase the dose to one milligram to maintain the same relief. He also reported at the time of, the, of his original appointment of uh, dysthymia, uh, which was a long-standing kind of low-level uh, mood disorder for which he was treated with citalopram, also known as Celexa, roughly two years before I first saw him. The citalopram was associated with some initial worsening of his RLS. Over the first month, his RLS got worse. His medical history otherwise is unremarkable. He doesn't have any symptoms of other sleep disorders including nothing suggesting obstructive sleep apnea. He does drink a bottle of wine with his wife three times a week. Um, he came back into the office uh, after that initial appointment, or no, at the initial appointment, he said to me that uh, even though he was taking the clonazepam one milligram and the citalopram, that his RLS had worsened again. He was having difficulty sleeping, and he was also having some problems with his mood as well, including loss of enthusiasm for work, uh, kind of uh, ruminations about the past and things that he had 
screwed up. Uh, he was describing uh, loss of uh, energy during the day and difficulties with concentration. He also said that since he began the clonazepam, he thinks that um, he was having some more difficulty with word finding, being unable to come up with the right word at the right time. So this is a kind of patient that I would see in my office, not infrequently, you know, somewhat different details, but um, this combination of uh, restless leg syndrome and a mood disorder, either a major mood disorder, major depression, or a minor mood disorder like dysthymia. Uh, to give some background, depression symptoms are common in people both with neurological disorders, as you can see a list on the left, and those with sleep disorders, a list on the right. So it was not um, unexpected that people with restless leg syndrome, like other people with neurological or sleep disorders, would also have uh, frequent symptoms of depression. This association had been recognized for um, quite a long time, let's say 150 years. Uh, Wittmach uh, in Germany, uh, before the name restless leg syndrome was well before it was um, invented, uh, called restless leg syndrome anxietis tibiarum. Uh, so I think, I don't speak Latin that well, but this has to do with an anxiety feeling associated with the tibial area, uh, which is the lateral or side parts of the uh, lower leg. And so this association between anxiety or mood issues and this uh, feeling that you have to move your legs has been recognized for a long, long time. So to uh, back up just a wee bit, um, I want to get everybody on the same page as to what major depressive disorder is. And commonly this was what people would call depression. In the DSM-5, the new Diagnostic and Statistical Manual put out by the American Psychiatric Association, these are the criteria required for a diagnosis. People have to have a depressed mood or loss of interest or pleasure in daily activities for at least two weeks. One of those things has to be present. They also have to have five of the following symptoms present nearly every day. That same depressed mood or irritability most of the day, a decreased interest or pleasure in most activities most of the day. Remember, one of those has to be present. And in addition, there have to be at least four of the following, significant weight change or change in appetite, a change in sleep, change in activity level with slowing down of movement or a lot of agitation, fatigue or loss of energy, uh, guilty feelings or feelings of worthlessness, impairment in concentration, and uh, or I should say thoughts of suicide. So at least four of those in addition to decreased mood or decreased interest. As you can see, many of these things could be present in somebody with restless leg syndrome just by virtue of their RLS. Changes in sleep, psychomotor agitation, fatigue, uh, and interference with concentration. But in addition, people with restless leg syndrome also have some of the core features of depression, whether it be decreases in mood or interest, feelings of guilt or worthlessness, or um, changes in appetite, or thoughts about death or suicide. So here's our build. So when we think about restless leg syndrome and major depressive disorder, they do have uh, some overlap in addition to the actual symptoms that overlap, they have other features that overlap. They both have relatively the same prevalence of 5 to 10 percent of the general population. They're both diagnosed by self-report, people describing it themselves rather than a blood test or an MRI. Both disorders are present in women more commonly than men. Both have strong genetic influences. 
and both have diurnal variation, meaning they change over the course of the day. Usually depression is worse in the morning, and of course we know that restless leg syndrome is worse at night. And in treatment studies, both respond both to medications, but also to some extent to placebo treatments, treatments that uh, where the act, there is no active ingredient in the pill per se, but something by virtue of the interaction with the care provider is helpful for the RLS symptoms or depression. So this is kind of a busy slide and um, I'm not going to ask anybody to memorize this, but the point here is that there have been many studies and there, this was from 2012, this uh, graphic, and there have been a number of studies since then which show that people with restless leg syndrome have a higher prevalence, uh, so frequency, of either depression symptoms or actual major depressive disorder. So that these two disorders really do uh, go together, certainly not in everybody, but more commonly than in the general population. And the odds of having uh, either depression symptoms or major depressive disorder in, major, in people with RLS is about double that in the general population. What does that boil down to? Roughly 20 to 40 percent of people with RLS meet the DSM criteria for either depression or dysthymia. When you ask people who have both, they will say that their RLS occurred first and that it was followed some years later by their major depressive disorder, by their depression. Here's just one study uh, just to give you an idea of uh, the risk. <clears throat> this was a study from the National, uh, from the Nurses Health Study of, um, uh, I can't remember, maybe 50,000 nurses who were asked at one time period, whether they had depression, whether they had RLS, as well as a bunch of other medical uh, conditions. And they looked at the people who had restless leg syndrome who did not have depression. And then they followed those people for six years. And they compared them to people who didn't have restless leg syndrome at the first assessment. And people who had restless legs at the first assessment had a 50% greater risk of developing new onset, never had it before, depression compared to people who didn't have restless legs. So restless legs is certainly a strong risk factor for depression. And here I tried to point this out. Somehow it looks like the graphic moved a little bit. That RLS is supposed to be right at the center of where somebody dropped a little pebble. And this is supposed to demonstrate that there are many ripples that uh, emerge in somebody who has restless leg syndrome. Certainly sleep disturbance, impairments in quality of life, uh, impairments in uh, work uh, uh, attendance, um, and as well, um, interference with a normal mood, i.e. the appearance of depression symptoms. What's also interesting though is another study, this one in Germany, and I would not be, don't even bother looking at the numbers here unless you get turned on by these kinds of things, but um, this uh, study demonstrated that not only does having RLS increase your risk of depression, but that depression increases your risk of having RLS. So this is a study where they looked at people um, in two different uh, independent studies and determined those people who did not have RLS but had depression. And then they followed up in one study two years and another study five years later and they found that the people who had depression had increased risk of developing restless leg syndrome. So that leads us to this very pretty graphic here where you can see there is this 
bi-directional association between RLS and depression. So that RLS on the top looks as if it can maybe cause depression, but that depression also can maybe cause RLS. And around and around and around you go. And so it is important in people who have both of these things to address both of them because each one can make the other one worse. A number of studies uh, looking at the specific drugs Rapinerol, known as Requip, Premipexol, known as Mirapex, and Gabapentin, known as Horizon, have looked at people who had RLS, who were in their clinical trials, and had depression symptoms and then were treated with uh, each of these drugs. Each one of them is approved by the FDA for the treatment of RLS, but in the trial they looked at not only did how the RLS improved, but they looked at how the depression symptoms improved. And in each one of the studies, the RLS improved, but also the depression symptoms improved over the course of the six to 12 weeks in those trials. So the opposite kinds of uh, question frequently arises. If I get treatment for my depression, will it worsen my restless leg syndrome or will it improve my restless leg syndrome? And at this point in time, we don't know for certain whether treatment of depression with an SSRI, and that those are the medicines Fluoxetine, Prozac, Paroxetine, Paxil, Sertraline, Zoloft, Citalopram, and s citalopram which is Celexa and Lexapro, Venlafaxine, which is Effexor, whether any of those, when you treat depression, could make restless legs worse, which has been a kind of an observation among those of us who are in this field. One large study done by automated phone interview suggested that this class of antidepressants actually was a risk factor for restless legs. But in another study, there was um, no data to support that conclusion. And so I think the jury is still out on this issue. Certainly treatment of depression is key in people who have depression, but which type of medication is optimal is another uh, story, and it's still not clear whether SSRIs, those medicines that I mentioned, uh, can worsen RLS. We do know quite clearly that those types of medicines do um, uh, produce an increase in periodic leg movements of sleep. And I have no idea if anybody can see my cursor. I can't see him. Oh, there it is. So I, you, if you can see my cursor, that's great. If not, that's a bummer. Um, but let's just look at the red bars here. And here are the number of periodic leg movements per hour of sleep in people not on an antidepressant. Here are the number of periodic leg movements in those on an antidepressant called bupropion or Wellbutrin, which is a not a serotonergic antidepressant but a dopamine norepinephrine antidepressant, no different than controls. But when you look at the two right sections, venlafaxine, which is a serotonergic antidepressant that also has noradrenergic properties, you can see the big increase compared to controls. And the same thing is true with the SSRIs, the Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Celexa, Lexapro family. So whether serotonergic antidepressants worse than RLS is not clear, but they certainly increase the number of leg movements during sleep. Why would there be this association of RLS and depression? And I don't have any answers for you there. We have many hypotheses, but um, no clear answers. One primary hypothesis has to do with the possibility that RLS disturbs sleep and that sleep disturbance over time leads to an increase in depression symptoms. 
This is something we certainly see in people with insomnia, where insomnia is a very clear risk factor for future major depression. Whether RLS follows the same course is not clear, but there is a suggestion from the literature that the sleep disturbance of RLS is what predisposes to future depression symptoms. So this may actually be my last slide, and then we can move to questions. And it's a complicated slide, so I'll spend a little bit of time uh, discussing it. <clears throat> so this is uh, a question where um, somebody with depression um, comes in to the office, or let's say one of you has depression and also has RLS. The question is, what do you do? Do you treat the depression? Do you treat the RLS? Given that there's this bi-directional relationship, some people might feel, well, I'm going to treat the RLS because maybe the depression will go away. Or some people might say depression's really bad, so I'm going to treat the depression uh, first and see what happens. And I think that we generally break this down. There, there's no data on this. This is just opinion of those of us uh, in the field but this is how we would think about it. In those people with mild depression um, or otherwise known as dysthymia, we may treat the restless leg syndrome first. So if they've got mild depression, dysthymia, and RLS, treat the RLS first. As uh, you may be aware, RLS treatments are effective uh, rapidly and um, then we can see if the depression persists. If, the, if it does not persist, if it goes away, that's great. You've killed two birds with one stone. I don't like the idea of killing birds at all, but I guess if we have to kill any birds, one stone is better than two for some reason. And so we've gotten rid of both problems with one treatment. However, if the depression persists, then we would want to think carefully about the type of antidepressant that we would use. In general, for people particularly with mild depression, I'm going to use bupropion uh, because I'm going to try to avoid the serotonin-related antidepressants. I'm also going to try to do a careful evaluation of other causes of sleep problems because as we've seen and as I've described, sleep problems in general can increase the uh, likelihood that somebody develops depression and can increase the likelihood that our treatments for depression will not be effective. So I'm going to, in these people with mild depression, I'm going to treat the RLS first. If the depression goes away, great. If not, if it persists, then I'm going to generally add bupropion. I'm also going to make sure that people are spending enough time in bed and that they don't have other reasons for sleep disturbance, whether they, those be obstructive sleep apnea, poor sleep habits like irregular bedtimes and wake times, using excess alcohol or caffeine, or have other uh, problems that might predispose to sleep disturbance. On the other hand, if people have severe depression, which is commonly associated with uh, suicidality and significant loss in function, I'm going to treat both of the problems simultaneously. I'm not going to treat the RLS and wait to see if the depression improves because depression, severe depression is a big deal. It's associated with significant um, problems in many spheres of life, and is also, as I'm sure you're aware, a risk for suicide. So severe depression is a fatal illness in some cases, and so I'm going to aggressively treat the depression, but I'm also going to simultaneously treat the restless leg syndrome. So as promised, 
this has been about 25 minutes and I'm going to uh, let Carla come back onto the line and uh, go with some of the questions that you've um, sent her. Great. Thank you, Dr. Winkleman. Great presentation. Um, I'm going to um, start the questions, and some will be a little bit of a reteach because I've noticed I've, we've had people add on during the um, presentation, so that way they can get the information as well. Uh, question one, what are the treatment options for RLS, and does depression cause it to appear? Mine is in, intermittent, like my RLS. Okay, so treatment options for RLS um, was not really the topic of today's talk, but I think is a very, very important question. And I think it's probably different for people who have intermittent symptoms for those who have mostly nightly symptoms. So there are some people who only have restless legs um, when they're in particular situations. So long plane rides, long car rides, uh, when they're um, at a movie or theater or symphony or maybe getting a massage or acupuncture or their hair done, basically where they have to be immobile for relatively long periods of time. People with intermittent symptoms, uh, I usually recommend use of a dopamine type drug because it's only going to be used irregularly and the complications of dopamine type drugs are not thought to appear with irregular use, meaning only occasional use of dopamine drugs, whether that's levodopa um, or whether it's rapinerol or pramipexol, they generally work fairly quickly and, uh, and if you take them in advance because you know the situation's uh, problematic for you, you can prevent the symptoms. Now, for people with frequent RLS symptoms, so let's say at least four times a week associated with moderate distress, it's a little bit more complicated answer. Traditionally, we have used one of the dopaminergic drugs, whether those are the uh, rapinerol or pramipexol or the newer patch retigotine. Um, or the other approved uh, RLS medicine, gabapentin, um, and a, and a carbol or horizon. Um, I think that many of us in the field are probably at this point in time somewhat reluctant to start with a dopaminergic drug, one of the dopamine drugs, and would rather use a non-dopamine drug in somebody who we think is going to be using this every day for long periods of time, meaning for 5, 10, 20, 40 years, because the complications of the dopamine drugs um, are significant, in particular a worsening of RLS known as augmentation. I hope I answered that, Carla. If not, let me know which okay. part I didn't. Okay, I think you got it. Um, what can I do to stop the RLS symptoms? I'm getting really depressed and anxious. Well, we just talked about treatments for RLS, and it sounds as if uh, this is somebody who has them uh, at least four times a week, and they're associated with moderate distress. And I just described the the uh, most common uh, and certainly FDA approved treatments for restless legs. I think where you want to start is go to a healthcare provider who is knowledgeable about the treatment of RLS. Whether that means going on the RLS.org website and looking for a center of excellence or a, a list of providers in your area who are knowledgeable about RLS who can do the appropriate workup make sure that you're not taking any medications that are making it worse, making sure you're not iron deficient, and if those things are not present, uh, potentially starting an effective medicine for RLS, of which there are a, quite a number of them. But you want to talk to your healthcare provider and make sure that they are knowledgeable about this disorder. Okay, thank you. Is RLS-associated depression worse in some age categories than others? There's a complicated question, and I would say the short answer is, I don't think so. So the question was, 
if RLS is causing depression, is that depression worse if you're a teen versus if you're in your 20s, 40s, 60s, or 80s? And I don't think there's any evidence that the associated depression is worse in any particular age group. And it's not even clear if the severity of RLS predicts how likely it's going to be that you develop depression. Um, so I'd have to say I, the answer is I don't think so. Okay. We all have depression from time to time. How do we recognize the various kinds of depression? Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's what they wrote, so I wanted to include that. Yes, I'm not sure you had to add the thanks, but I appreciate it, Carla. <laughs> we should probably mute you for now. <laughs> um, so, uh, gosh, all of that, and I forget what the question was. Okay, you you're having a good time with me. I'll read it again. We all have depression from time to oh, time. Okay, I got it. Recognize the various kinds of depression. So if you go back to my slides, I am now going back here. Hopefully there's still up, oh, oops, there we go. So here is the definition of major depressive disorder. So this is what uh, the American Psychiatric Association has agreed is what we are going to call major depression or significant depression. Two weeks or at least two weeks of depressed mood or loss of interest or pleasure in daily activities m nearly every day, most of each day for at least two weeks. And then these additional symptoms, changes in appetite, changes in sleep, changes in activity level, changes in energy, feelings of worthlessness or guilt, impairment in concentration, uh, and thoughts of suicide or death. So you have to have the decrease in mood um, uh, or loss of interest or pleasure and four of those others. If you have five all together, that's major depressive disorder and that warrants treatment because major depressive disorder is a significant medical problem. It makes other medical problems worse. It worsens outcomes of other medical problems like diabetes or coronary artery disease and in severe cases is associated with significant uh, social and professional impairment and risk of death due to suicide. So I hope that answers your question. If you have any questions about whether you have depression or how severe it is, I would strongly encourage you to talk to your healthcare provider. Okay, thanks. Um, can the use of opioid drugs cause or exacerbate depression in RLS patients? Interesting question. So as uh, some of you may know and what the question alludes to is that opioids and that's oxycodone and known as otherwise as Percocet or um, hydrocodone, Vicodin or methadone um, are used for the treatment of restless leg syndrome. In people whose uh, treatment is not otherwise effective with other medications. And so the question that the, um, is being asked is whether those opioid medicines can make depression worse. And I use a fair amount of opioids in my practice in people with RLS because I see people with very severe RLS. And I have to say, in general, uh, mood improves with the use of opioids, not because people are getting a buzz or getting high from the opioids. In fact, people say that they don't even notice any of that uh, euphoric quality from the medication because we're using low doses, um, but because they're so, so miserable because their RLS is so out of control that when it gets under control with the opioid that they feel so much better. However, I think that there is a risk, and what it is I can't tell you, maybe 10% of people, maybe less, who take an opioid can 
have a worsening of mood due to the opioid medication. Let's call it kind of like a side effect, an unusual side effect, but one that can happen. And if that uh, occurs, I, I tell the patient that they should stop the opioid medicine uh, so that their mood can return to normal, and we can try another approach to treating their RLS. Okay. Is there anything beyond conventional treatment for both RLS and depression that will help improve both conditions? Well, there are unconventional treatments for every disorder that exists. So absolutely there are unconventional treatments. And the problem with unconventional treatments is they're unconventional generally because they haven't been tested. And so therefore using your use of the unconventional treatments is based upon your comfort level with treatments that haven't been tested in a, in a systematic way. If you're somebody who feels comfortable with that, then I think you can feel uh, comfortable generally with using unconventional treatments. If you're not and you like to see that it's been tested in a lot of people, then these unconventional treatments may not be for you. Now let me be specific. Um, for restless leg syndrome, I would say unconventional treatments, there's a broad, broad range uh, from the completely wacky to the uh, a little bit more reasonable. Um, most of them are not associated with uh, significant risk, um, you know, dangers. Um, the only danger is for many of them is, is that they won't work and you're just going to waste time. But I've heard things like people putting a bar of soap under their mattress, people putting magnets under their mattress. I would consider those kind of in the wacky area. Uh, then less uh, unconventional treatments but less wacky might include acupuncture, um, some kinds of uh, exercise therapy in fact have been shown to be effective for RLS so they're I think probably somewhat more conventional. Um, the exercise has been shown to be effective in people with RLS who have renal failure. Whether that works as well for people without renal failure is not clear. Um, we did a study recently using a TENS device, uh, transcutaneous electric nerve stimulation, so low levels of electricity. Um, they are administered in the lower leg where the RLS is to see if we could activate the nerves there and uh, reduce the RLS sensations. So we use this census device and in uh, nine of the nine people we looked at, six got some benefit, but remember there's strong placebo effects in RLS, so you have to take that with a big grain of salt. Um, other unconventional treatments, there's a couple of studies looking at near infrared light um, to see whether that is um, helpful. I'm trying to think of other things. There are um, magnesium treatments have been used. Um, there's also some studies with uh, vitamin C, uh, selenium, um, trying to think of other food, uh, nutritional supplements. Uh, none are coming There's to me this right one now. That is, um, sorry, if I can say one that we hear a lot at the offices about Sertami on the internet. It's you can get it on Amazon.com. It's basically it has valerian root in it, magnesium, calcium, vitamin E, um, a few of those things. So a lot of people ask us about that. Yeah, and you know I say to people, give those things a shot. I think in general they're not going to produce side effects. Valerian, uh, if you take too much of it, is is unsafe, so you do need to be careful with valerian. But um, and these these combo treatments that you get over Amazon, there's not anything. They they don't have to they, they can basically make claims without any evidence, which I think is unfortunate. There's also the uh, Relaxis device that uh, you'll see promoted on the internet which is kind of a magic fingers kind of thing, a vibrating pad that you put underneath your legs 
uh, there was one study of that for restless legs. It actually was shown not to work for restless legs, although it did reduce uh, the insomnia uh, associated uh, with restless legs uh, in those trials. So there are also a, a variety of unconventional treatments for depression. Um, some of them are becoming more conventional, like a transcutaneous magnetic stimulation. So this is uh, a magnet that is put up uh, next to the, uh, the temple area and puts magnetic um, stimulation into the brain, produces a small amount of current uh, that goes into the brain. Um, you, you don't even really feel it. Um, and I, that is approved for the, for the treatment of depression. Um, so there are a lot of unconventional treatments, a lot of conventional treatment or less con conventional treatments. And with, which one of those you use, as I said, depends on your comfort level. I would certainly talk to your healthcare provider uh, before um, doing anything that's too unusual um, and get their advice. Can I ask you one question? This came up today at the office. Was um, spinal cord stimulation for the treatment of RLS? Are there any studies on that? There are um, a couple of studies of spinal cord uh, stimulation. Um, one of them is transcutaneous. Um, and, you know, I'd have to say the jury is still out on that. And um, and I think we there just like a lot of these other studies, uh, we need we need more data to see whether that is effective or not. Okay. Um, next question: Are people diagnosed with depression and RLS more likely to get dementia and Alzheimer's than the rest of the population? No. Okay. I, I want to make that clear. There's no evidence that people with restless leg syndrome have increased risk of dementia. There are some suggestions uh, that people with restless leg syndrome have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, whether that be heart attacks, um, hypertension, or stroke. And I guess those things in turn could over time lead to uh, dementia, but there's no suggestion that people with RLS have increased risk of dementia. Okay. Great. Um, should a person with RLS and signs of depression take two antidepressants such as bupropion and trazodone? Well, I Obviously, this is somebody who is taking bupropion and trazodone and wants to know if their doctor is doing the right thing. And, you know, I can't really comment on anybody's individual treatment. However, those are antidepressants that are generally not associated with worsening of RLS. So bupropion is a reasonable antidepressant to use for somebody with depression. Um, it doesn't work in um, some percentage of people, just like all antidepressants. So you need to keep open the possibility of using other antidepressants. Trazodone is generally not used as a standalone antidepressant these days because at the antidepressant doses, which are between 300 and 600 milligrams, it has a lot of side effects. It can lead to... Um, blood pressure drop when people stand up. Uh, rarely it can lead to priapism or prolonged painful erections. It can lead to excessive daytime sleepiness. But in low doses, it is uh, commonly used, and in fact it's used in 1% of adults in the United States as a medicine to help with sleep. So I could imagine somebody with RLS and depression getting Welbutrin or Bupropion for the depression and Trazodone for any persistent sleep problems. But I don't hear about any treatment for the RLS itself. I should note that Bupropion may be effective alone for people with RLS, with particularly with mild RLS. There's one study that suggested it might be helpful, but for the person who asked that question, 
um, I don't hear any RLS treatments per se. Okay. Um, next question, how do I tell if I'm depressed or just sleep deprived? That's a difficult question to answer and I see people almost every week where I have to discriminate between those two. I have to decide is this person, and if you look at the slide that's up in front of you, is this person moody and irritable, um, uh, agitated, fatigued, um, having problems with concentration and feeling that life's not so great and maybe even not worth living because they're not sleeping or because they have an independent uh, major m depression. And um, I spend an hour with people trying to figure out which one of those things it is. So I can't really give you any quickie answers here uh, on this webinar because we don't have an hour and um, because we don't have an hour. And so um, it's a difficult question. I think you go to your healthcare provider and bring up that question saying I haven't been sleeping and I feel bad in these ways. I'm not sure whether it's just the sleeplessness or I really have a depression. Sometimes your healthcare provider will give you a week of a sleeping medicine and the sleeping medicine won't treat depression. So they give you a week of the sleeping medicine if once you sleep better with the sleep medicine all of those depression symptoms go away, well you've kind of got your answer. If on the other hand you start sleeping really well and the depression, the, the um, moodiness, the irritability, the lack of interest and pleasure, the appetite change, the energy change, the negative thoughts, uh, if those persist, well then you've got an answer that it probably wasn't the sleep problem that was the most important, but it was the depression that was the most important. Okay. Next question. What is the difference between situational depression and true clinical depression? Are they treated di differently or is there a different prognosis? Uh, good question. And I think this depends upon the person. Situ you know, there's many reasons to be depressed. People could have uh, lost a loved one, lost a job, um, had a significant medical um, problem or scare, um, and in those contexts could have had a lot of these symptoms that I list here um, on, on the screen. And, and those would be completely natural feelings and physical symptoms to have as a response. At a certain point, those symptoms become less appropriate and mourning is extending, let's say you've lost a loved one, mourning is ex extending beyond the point where we would consider it quote unquote normal. And um, how long that is, I think, is, is not absolutely clear. I think the DSM has a time cutoff, although to be perfectly honest, I don't know what it is. Um, but I think it's something to, uh, again, discuss with your health care provider. Say, look, I lost my husband or my parent or my kid or my sibling a year ago and I still have all of these depression symptoms and I just haven't snapped back to being my old self. And um, I think you have a conversation with the healthcare provider as to whether it's appropriate for you to get some treatment for the mood disorder, whether it be psychotherapy treatment or whether it be medication treatment. Okay. See, I'm gonna go back and get some other questions for you. Okay. Is RLS associated with high levels of cortisol? 
I don't think so. Insomnia has been associated in some studies with elevations in cort cortisol or the hormone that promotes cortisol, ACTH. I'm trying to think if high levels of cortisol have been seen in people with RLS, and I don't think that that has been found. Okay. What are the benefits of reducing opioid doses versus the stress of withdrawal and RLS discomfort? Can the stress of the withdrawal be null? Can it be what? Null, zero. Um, they they have a, you know trying to get as many they have a character when they write in they can put so many oh. characters so I think they're trying to say you know is is it worth it? So this is an important question throughout RLS treatment. You're being treated with whatever medication it is. It's rapinerol, it's primapexol, it's methadone, it's gabapentin and a carbol, it's pregabalin, it's gabapentin. And ten, you're getting treatment for your RLS and things are going pretty well. Maybe you've got some side effects, whatever they might be, of one of the medicines or the other, but maybe not. And maybe you're trying to figure out whether you can do with a lower dose or you're trying to figure out, gosh, do I still have RLS? And so people will think ab about tapering down on their medicine or potentially even tapering off their medicine. And if this is something that people uh, decide they're interested in, I absolutely support it because we always want to try to use the lowest effective dose and if people are having side effects it's possible that there might be a dose that's lower and still works or it's always a possibility that their RLS has gone away. In people with more, who had more severe RLS before treatment, that's generally unlikely. But in people with mild RLS before treatment, I think that that is possible. So I think it is worth talking to your doctor about very gently reducing the dose of the medication, whether it's an opiate, or a dopamine drug, or what we call an alpha-2 delta, which is gabapentin, or gabapentin and a carbol, or pregabalin, which is Lyrica. Whether it's any of those things, you want to go slowly. That you've been on it however long, six months, a year, two years, five years, there's no big rush. And in general, what we find, particularly for the dopamine drugs, is that when you decrease the dose, you're going to have a flare up in symptoms. You can count on it. Let's call it withdrawal. You're going to have a flare up in symptoms that may last days or sometimes even a couple of weeks. And so you should anticipate that, expect it. And if you want to follow through with this approach, try to ride it out. If after a couple of weeks, the symptoms are not going away, then I think you may need to reassess whether tapering is reasonable. But you want to go very, very slowly when you go down, especially on the dopamine drugs. And I'm talking about 10% of your, uh, however much you're taking, every two to four weeks. So that it could take months to get down or off of the medication, but the slower you go, I th in my experience, the more successful you'll be. Okay. Another question we have is I'd like to know how to treat RLS and anxiety disorders together. Is it Do you treat them the same as you do depression? Good question. In general, many of the anxiety disorder treatments are um, the same as the as the depression treatments. And I want to make clear something that I, I think I neglected before is that psychotherapy treatments, talking treatments, can be very effective for both 
depression and anxiety disorders. And I didn't mention that in my slides. I really kind of stuck to medication approaches and that was an omission on my part. Talking therapies, psychotherapy can be very helpful for both mood and anxiety disorders. So those uh, don't make restless legs worse so we don't have to worry about it the way we do with the SSRIs. And the same thing for um, anxiety disorders. Medication-wise, um, the treatments are oftentimes very similar, whether we're talking about SSRIs, um, uh, but there are additional treatments for anxiety disorders, medication-wise, that could be considered, uh, whether it be buspirone, which is buspar, whether that worsens RLS isn't clear, or benzodiazepines. Many times people will use lorazepam or clonazepam. Ativan or clonopin for anxiety disorders. And those do not worsen RLS. They um, potentially could help with RLS, although there's no data to suggest that. And my experience has been that clonazepam is not a great treatment for RLS. Um, it does help with sleep, and so that's good, but not necessarily so much for the RLS. Uh, although improving sleep does help with RLS. Those medicines can be very helpful for uh, anxiety disorders. So some of the treatments are the same for depression and anxiety. Some of them are distinct. Um, and, um, and I think you want to um, talk to your healthcare provider about the specifics. Okay. I'm looking, I'm going through the question list here. Okay, take your time, Carla. <laughs> yeah. um, one question we always have is, why don't doctors recognize RLS and understand its treatment? It's so frustrating to keep explaining myself. It's a real shame. That's all I can say. I think awareness has improved. I know it's improved in the last 20 years, but it's still suboptimal. It's, we still have a long way to go in terms of awareness. That's one of the missions of the Restless Leg Syndrome Foundation is to improve um, awareness about restless legs so that when you go in to see a doctor and you say you have RLS, they don't go, huh? Or say, don't worry about it. Or say, um, you know, you're sure it's not depression or something that's not particularly helpful. Hopefully, they you go in and say, I've got this uncomfortable feeling in my legs, it happens at night, and when we move around it gets better, and they say that's RLS, and there are a number of possible treatments for it, and I'm going to do an evaluation and workup first. I can't tell you why awareness is low, but I think we can all work to improve it. All right. well, I'm going to get kind of... Um parlay that into the um, paper that you just worked on, the white paper, you know, it, the, we just did a huge mail out to over 50,000 physicians in a direct mailing from the foundation on the, um, you know, the prevention and treatment um, of um, augmentation. So if you'd like to talk a little bit about that and where we are with it. and Well, I think that this is a uh, valuable paper because we have made progress on awareness of RLS. So more RLS is getting treated. <clears throat> unfortunately, and that's good, but unfortunately some of the treatments, and in particular the dopamine treatments, um, can over time in some people, probably not everybody, but let's say 50% of people over time, their RLS will get worse with RLS treatment with the dopamine drugs. That's pramipexol, rapinerol, retigotine, or levodopa. That's Requip, Mirapex, Nupro, or Cinemet. And so we felt that it was important now that we've improved awareness of RLS to improve awareness of this complication of treatment of RLS. And I'm not going to go into great detail. I'm sure that Carla uh, can give people access to the uh, white paper, you know, which is meant for physicians, but is in relatively plain English. And it was an effort to uh, increase awareness about this, 
allow people to identify when augmentation was happening, try to help um, doctors avoid the appearance of augmentation by choosing an appropriate medication for first-line treatment. And then finally, if they have somebody, one of their patients, who has augmentation, worsening of RLS due to drug treatment, to give them some guidance on what approaches they should use to try to reverse that worsening and get people back to where they were um, before they started the uh, RLS treatment that made things worse. Carla, you can get people access to the white paper? We sure can if you um, email us at info at rls.org or carla at rls.org, and that's Carla with a K. Um, we can uh, provide you the link to that paper. Yep, or you And if you attended the um, your a local support group leader, we had that paper in that we just did a whole toolkit for um, RLS support group leaders, which you reviewed for us, Dr. Winkleman, and sent that out along with some supporting materials. So if you're in, um, I would check your local area to see if there's a support group um, meeting going on, and you can see it there and see the presentation. Cool. Great. That's great. Great. Well, yes, we're happy to provide for you. We also have uh, handouts, whatever, you know, if you're, if you're having any sort of issue, always touch base with us. We have the information that you need the, to support um, your um, quest, you know, with your physician to get things straight, you know, and are thankful to our members of our scientific and medical advisory board that help us to um, write and review all of these um, papers that, and information that is available to members. Very good. All right. Well, I want to thank you for um, your presentation and for answering so many questions. This was very helpful. And uh, again, if we can um, provide you with any information, please contact us here at the foundation. Thank you very much, Carla. I hope everyone has a wonderful, restful weekend. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.